that way, a way that we can understand what that looks like of walking in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Because I really believe that, that that's how He created us to live. That's how He created us to be. So I want to open up for a text in Zechariah chapter 4. Church at large, 
is that, and I think it's just a part of mankind, a part of our flesh, is to be self-sufficient, to learn to do, we, there's, it's, it's like there's this part of man that thrives off of doing something in my own strength. It, it's so, and I believe this is based in pride. It's so strong that I can overcome and then I can tell somebody that I overcame. Then I can brag about it. And we always are seeking to do things after our own strength. And you know, we can know the scripture, but we forget so easily how to rely on God. And we, we almost default to relying on our flesh, right? Even when we're struggling, you know, and I'm going to talk about, um, you know, battling the flesh. I want to talk about battling sin, overcoming sin, and also just in even fulfilling the calling of God on your life and how that's achieved. Okay? Because sometimes when we look at, you know, we take, for instance, the Great Commission, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, and it's interesting to me that um, having been around for a while, been around the block a few times, I've observed people going out to fulfill that call. Go ye into all the world. Um, you know, people have become missionaries or preachers and, and have spent their life doing it in their flesh. This, this is true. That they have spent their life doing it in their flesh. And it seems like uh, the church is really good on, in, in a, on programs, on uh, the things that we need. We're really good at educating people. Right? We've got Bible colleges all over the place. We're the most educated, I mean, if you will, uh, in head knowledge educated body in the history of the church. As far as what we have filled our mind with facts. And we're in the information era. Right? And so we tend to rely on all these things to do what needs to be done. And we keep thinking, well, if we have more money, all right, or we, we, or we want to, you know, start uh, outreach programs, and those things are great. But sometimes I feel like, and, and it kind of expands our entire walk with God. It, it, it expands through your personal life, your personal walk. You're, the way that you deal with the flesh, and also even the things that you do for God, of a reliance itself. And so, I, I would say that self-sufficiency is one of the greatest enemies of the church today. Um, you know, we, we keep thinking, well, if we just had some more money, we could really make things happen. Right? There's, there's this, you know, and that's the thing. Of, the idea of power is the ability to do. The ability to do. That's the definition of power. And so we think that by, if we could just have a little bit more training, a little bit more head knowledge, a little bit more money, if, and even, you know, as sharing the word, sometimes as a preacher, we'll put our, we'll put our trust in how well I prepared a message. And if I can deliver the right message, then maybe God will come down. As if, do you see the self-sufficiency in that? There's so much self-reliance. And he says, you know, I just define power for you. It's the ability to do. And he said, it is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's financial power. There's intellectual power. There's all kinds of of power in the world, and we tend to rely on those things. But I like what in Acts chapter 1, you know, we, we, we hear the call to go, and we must go, right? But, you know, before he said go, he said wait, <laughs> right? Yeah. He, before he said go, he said wait. I'm going to turn there, Acts chapter 1. <laughs> there's, there's a place of success in this walk that can only be fulfilled if we do one thing. And, and if we don't do the one thing, all of our efforts are in vain. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that I can waste God's time, my time, your time, 
if I won't do the one thing that he said that this is the key that you can bear fruit, right? <laughs> So Acts chapter 1, a lot of you guys are familiar with this, I'm sure. It says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. You know, the, the interesting thing is that we haven't, we, we want to go out in the world, and, and yet we haven't taken that time to receive that power. We haven't gone to that place to do what God has called us to do, right? And so, um, you know, the the gospel is this: it's, it's a, the gospel is good news. It is that we can overcome. It is that there is there we can live in this life more than conquerors. And that gospel is this: it's Messiah Christ in you, the hope of glory, that He would be manifested in my body, that he be manifested in me, that that I could, see, I could, if, if we go out and I carry words, I'm not carrying truth, okay, words aren't truth, even words that are true aren't truth unless you're true, remember that, they came to Yeshua and they said, Master, we know that you are true, and that you speak the word of God in truth. Right? There's a lot of people that speak the word of God, and that's always true, right? But, you know, many of the Pharisees, they weren't true. And they, they, but they recognized that Yeshua was true. That means that he was, he was living and walking it out. Yeshua said in John 16, 7, he said, It's better for you if I go away. Like, your guy's got a plan. You know, here he is in the flesh, he's with them. And he can only be in one place at one time. And it was powerful. Wasn't it powerful? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Did all the changed lives everywhere he went. And he says, but I've got a better plan than that. You know, we all think, well, what if we could just, wouldn't it be a better plan, God, if you just left your son on the earth and you just stay with us until we get it right? <laughs> right? Like the physical presence. And he's like, I've got a better plan than me being present with you. Right? Because the plan of God is that He be manifested in us. The plan of God is that, that He would have people that would say, I surrender myself. Here's a body. Here's a life. And you can do anything you want with. Just come and, and, and just go start talking to people and do your ministry through me. Like in, in reality, the reality, the true ministry of the gospel is Yeshua in us, right? We've got a lot of words, but the world's waiting to see the character of God in us, Amen. right? The world is waiting uh, to see love in action, to see humility. I mean, the attributes of God, the attributes of God are amazing, and, and according to Scripture, they're manifested in us by the Holy Spirit. He, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to send a comforter to you, right? I won't leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And so in other words, he says, I'm coming back, but I'm coming back in another form. I'm coming back in the form of the Spirit. I'm going to live inside you, and I'm going to enable you to do everything like I did. That you can live like I live. And, and we have developed within a lot of times in Christianity doctrine that says, you know, we can't do we can't even, you know, they teach us that I, I can't even live a victorious life and overcome sin. They tell us that we're all sinners and we might as well forget about victory in this life. As a matter of fact, it's taught that in order to be holy, you have to die in your physical body. Because they say that you can't expect sanctification and holiness in this life. But I would say, as my wife said this last week, that they have greatly underestimated the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we, are we by those things, are we insulting the God of, heaven, of the heavens and the earth when we say, I can't do it, I can't overcome sin? Are we doing that? But, you know, let me tell you, this is how it happens, is that we, we try to live the Christian life, we try to walk the life of a believer in our flesh. 
without yielding and dependence on the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we fail over and over and over. And we're trying hard. Let me tell you, you know, it, when we're walking in that realm of flesh, we're trying to overcome the flesh. We really want to defeat sin, but we have this reality that takes place that is that I have tried a thousand times to beat this, and it keeps defeating me. But what we're not realizing is that we have sought to do in our flesh what only can be done by the Holy Spirit. And nobody's taught us how to walk in the Holy Spirit. Nobody's taught us how to live. The flesh loves religion. The, the flesh loves the form of the approach to God. Go into, you know, go to a Catholic church, man, they've got a beautiful form of approach, right? Didn't the scripture talk about that they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof? We're talking about having a confession, but it's not a reality. And I really wish somebody a long time ago taught me how to lean on the Holy Spirit in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what? We, we fail. We, we try to do it in the flesh. And we fail so many times that we finally conclude doctrinally <laughs> that victory is not possible in this life. And we build doctrine on it because we haven't experienced it. Because we haven't done what he told us to do. The one thing. Amen. 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 You know what? It's amazing to me, guys. We will do anything but what God's called us to do. Anything but what we will we will climb mountains. Okay? We'll give our lives as missionaries. We will give and we'll empty even our pocketbooks. But we won't do the one thing that was the key to the victory in the early church. And that was prayer. Prayer brings revival. Prayer moves the heart of God. I mean, I'm not talking about just surface prayer, but I'm talking about heart crying out. Prayer is mighty with God. And I'm, I'm saying it, and I'm not talking about this church, okay? Just, but I'm just saying that, but we're all susceptible, right? I have been. That we just keep making more programs. We keep just, we'll do all these things. We'll pour effort into it. But the prayer meeting, you can't get nobody to come to them. In a lot of churches, okay? Because what is it? See, our flesh will do anything. But that one true spiritual exercise it hates. That spiritual exercise is prayer. That spiritual exercise is uniting with God. You know, he's showing this to me. Sean, you need a better prayer life. Because you're never going to do anything. Unless you connect with me. Because I'm the source of power. And you, you can... You can study, you can, you know, you can do, you know, you can get great worship, you can get, you can get strobe lights up here, you can get a fog machine, you can put on a good show, and you know what, some of the church is into this, and I'm not trying to bash the church, okay, it's because we've gone astray somewhere, we have forgotten that revival only comes by the power of the Holy Spirit and by us connecting with God. And we, instead of doing that one thing, will do anything but that one thing. Why? And I know I'm stressing this point, but why is it that we won't enter into communion and prayer and spend time with Him? Right? You know, there, there's a whole tradition that says that when they took up the Apostle James' body as he was martyred, that they found out uh, as they were taking his body and preparing for burial, they said that he had the knees of a camel. And I would submit to you that the power of the early church was from camel's knees. Because 
You know, nobody knew he had camel sneeze until they took up his body because he didn't go around bragging about it. Right? Because of the humility that real prayer brings. You're not going to brag about your spiritual conquest or who you are. You're only going to brag about who he is. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what. The flesh is operating in the church. And, and, and the weak, the terrors, they, they go together. They look a lot alike. Right? But, but the weak that's weighed down with his glory bows. It's humble. Yeah. It's easy to be entreated. It's gentle. It's strong, right? But it's but there's a gentleness there. That's the character of God. Amen. That, that we need to have. Amen. Um, John 15. This is such an important truth, you guys. And, you know, we've been told over and over in Scripture about it. And, and, I, and I don't know why. You know, isn't it amazing to me that a subject can be talked about so much and we're so slow to enter it? But why? I mean, I'm really, I'm really want to get, I want to get you the question, why? It's been why does my flesh not want to enter into this place with it? Why is it that I'll go through my whole day and I end up going to bed and I didn't have intimate time in prayer with God? Maybe I, I made time for. Why is my flesh? You, you know, we're talking about crucified the flesh here. Right. So Yeshua said in verse one, "I am the vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Yeah, I don't know. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, He takes away." Let's just stop real quick there. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. You know, this is a, a fearful reality. We read this and we think, wow, if I bear bad fruit, I'm going to be taken away and cast into the fire. That's what it says. And so therefore, what do we do? I better try really hard to bear fruit. That, and, and so, you know, have you ever seen a fruit tree? Put it out for go, oh, come on, fruit, come out. Oh, come on, come on, grow, grow. You know, that effort, right? You know, it's interesting about a tree that fruit is, is a natural and unstoppable effect of the overflow of life inside the tree. It is an unstoppable, there is no effort, no tree ever put effort into bearing fruit. Fruit is the overflow of life. If you withhold food and you withhold water from that plant, it will not bear fruit that year. That tree, it won't bear fruit. It doesn't have the overflow. But the overflow of the abundance of life on the inside, it just bursts out everywhere it can possibly burst out. And that's the gospel. Yeah. The gospel is that you should have the life of God in you so much. that you. And so instead of abiding in Him, we put all the focus on bearing fruit. You guys see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And we get frustrated. I've, I've been guilty of it. Frustrated. God, I'm, I'm not even going to share your word anymore because I don't see results. <laughs> right? Or, how long, God? Why don't you do something? You know, even getting almost kind of bold with him. And, and you know, he's, thank God he's merciful. He's like, well, actually, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> actually, I told you what to do. If you really want to bear fruit, and it wasn't, go see how great a musician you can be, or how great of a speaker you can be. That's not what I told you to do. And I would say this too, that God will let us fail a thousand times, ten thousand times, before he honors our flesh. He could never, he could never bring revival by something worked up in our flesh that ignored prayer. Okay? It's, it's just not going to happen. Or, or he'd be wrong. Because he said, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Okay, let's finish reading that. So he says, every branch that bears, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. He cleanses it. He, he prunes it, right? That it may, may bring forth more fruit. Now are you clean through the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, 
No more can you, except you abide in me. So he said that you can't bear fruit without it. He said that the key of being fruitful in this life is to abide in him. And that goes against everything that our flesh wants to do. I've got a few more scriptures to share. I want to turn to, because I, I said I wanted to just share like a practical way of walking with God and having good news. So I want to just talk about that a little bit. So in Romans chapter 6, this is just an area of scripture that God has really been highlighting to me here lately. Over and over again, really it's not, it's like, I thought I had that down already, but he keeps saying, no, you need to focus in here. And so I'm in Romans chapter 6. And I want to talk about here, um, you, you know, we talked about the key to being fruitful in missions, being fruitful in our life, being fruitful as workers for God. It's, it's by being filled with the Spirit and by uniting with God. But even, you know, in your practical everyday life, it's, it's like this, guys, it's everything that you do in life successfully is, is that's really of any value is dependent on the Holy Spirit. Amen. It doesn't matter what it is. It, it doesn't matter, you know, if, if it's your, your giftings, your calling, your walk. If you want to be successful in whatever he's called you to do, you got to learn to go deep in prayer. you got to go deep in prayer. Because I'll, I'll tell you what, one thing as I've studied revivals that I've learned is that every time that we've seen the church have real, true, God-sent revivals, it's been to uh, praying people. It's yeah. been because somebody has learned to literally take hold of God and get a hold of him. It's never come any other way. And the difference is this. You know, you, we, you can have the best uh, orators or speakers in the world preaching the Bible, preaching the word even, and even not um, messing it up. But they can have no power. Right? And it's kind of like something a lot of us have been guilty of. And the difference is this, is you can get up and, and you can do all the best that you can do. And, and God doesn't bless it because he, he blesses his spirit kind of flowing through you. But when people are really doing that one thing, there's no glory in it. Because we can't say, yeah, that was a result of this thing I did and that's when the revival came. Right? It's, it's, it's a result of us connecting with God. A, a result of his presence coming. Like... When, when the revival has come into different places, there's a manifestation, manifestation of the presence of God that can become almost tangible, where people fall under the conviction of sin and, and, and get free from sin oh, just yeah. from the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And without that, we're, we're spinning our wheels, right? So we really need, we really need it. So... And, and this is, part of this is expelling lies. I had a dream this last week, I think it was about a week ago, about an old man that was in a foxhole. And I was, I, I made the first attempt to go into this foxhole, and I had a machine gun. And so it was a, it, it was a, you know, a military operation, and I was to go in, but they were too strong, and I backed off a little bit, and then I kind of regrouped. It's like, no, I've got to take that. Just I knew in my mind, I gotta take that foxhole. And so I went in there. It was really different the next time. It was I was just like like sharp. I was just watching the fall, you know, taking these guys out. And I cleaned out this whole foxhole. It was really well established. It even had like an underground and it had wood and shored up. I mean, they spent a lot of time on this foxhole. And the last one that was in this foxhole was an old man. And the old man threw a grenade. And then he said something about the grenade and saying it's gonna it's gonna knock us all out. And it, we're we're all gonna die. And so I was like, okay, I got it. You know, I it was gonna be it was a, like a, a grenade I knew was gonna knock me unconscious and blow my eardrums out and all that. And so what I did is I put my head down, I laid on the ground and I covered my ears to try to protect myself. And something told me that that guy's lying, he's gonna kill you while you put your head down. And cover your ears. And so I took my, I said, I'm not going to be afraid of this grenade. 
I, and I got up and I looked and he was getting ready to come for me and I took my gun out and I shot him and I killed him. The grenade never went off. It was a lie. Mm -hmm. The grenade was a lie, mm -hmm. but by believing that lie, I could have been killed. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Right. And so I really, it was really interesting and the wife and I were talking about it. We started talking about how, you know, scripture talks about the old man. <laughs> right? And this is like a subject he was already highlighting to me, but I hadn't made the connection. Or Kel says, the Bible talks about the old man. I'm like, that's right. It does talk about the old man. And the old man is in a well-entrenched foxhole. And I need to learn to chase him out. Actually, every single one of us needs to learn to chase the old man out of the foxhole in this fashion. Amen. <laughs> this is amazing news, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that why he God came? forbid. Is his gospel so weak that he that they teach, some people teach he can he can forgive you of your sins while leaving you in bondage in them? Does that sound like strength? No. That's not strength. And he says right here, and people were teaching that back then too, just like they are today. Obviously, or Paul wouldn't be dealing with it, right? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How can you live any longer in sin? But then they're going to say, but we sin every day. We're all sinners. We all live in sin. Well, I'm sorry. Can we go to Romans 6? Because he says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Amen. People have a hard time with this within the church because they taught in some places all their walk with God that you can't live a victorious life because of their experience and they concluded and built a doctrine that it wasn't possible in this life. Wow, right? Because they didn't do it by the means <laughs> that he made for you to do it. I would tell you something. We're all in a battle with the flesh. Okay? Scripture says the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There is a battle between flesh and spirit, right? But there's a way to overcome the flesh, and that's to be in the spirit. And when we're in the spirit, and so really what's going on is if sin is, is dominant, if temptation is overtaking me, and I'm being brought into bondage, I need to not focus on fighting against that sin because I can't in my flesh. Okay? Romans 8, I think it's 8 7 says, They that are in their flesh cannot please God. Amen. You can't please God. The, the chapter right after Romans 6 that I'm reading to you from talks about, um, Paul says, I speak in verse 1, do you not know, you know, talking about the law, that the law is dominion over a man as long as he lives. And he's speaking to those that were on, they knew the law of God. They knew the requirement of God, but they didn't have the power to do it. And so he's speaking to those that did not have, Paul was not talking about his present experience in Romans 7. That is a long established foxhole by people who have misinterpreted scripture. Because if we conclude that the apostle Paul always did what he didn't want to do, was never doing what he wanted to do, then we might as well, since he was such a great man, conclude, well, if Paul couldn't achieve it, then what are, who are we to think we could ever have victory in this life? And that's where the bondage takes place, largely a lot of times because of the misinterpretation of Romans 7. But Paul's not talking to believers in the Messiah. He's saying, I speak to those that know the law. I'm speaking to those that are under the old covenant, but are outside of Messiah. Paul's saying, I've experienced that. I know what it was like to be in my flesh and be religious and, and say, I don't want to do this, but then to fall short and to fail because I'm walking in my flesh. So Romans 7 is the attempt of someone trying to serve God while abiding in the realm of the flesh. That is the correct interpretation of Romans 7. And if not, then you have invented an old wretched man that I am, Christianity, mm -hmm. that has no power in it. Right. But my 
scripture says that the Son of God was manifested that Hallelujah. he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Woo! And he said that who the Son sets free is free indeed. Yeah. Woo! So how can we take a doctrine and because we make Paul into a, a, a constantly failing guy, we really throw up our hands and say, let's just build that into a doctrine. We're never going to have victory in this life. You're not going to be holy till you die. But, then, but, but scripture says, be ye holy for I am holy. Right? He has, he, he's called the Holy Spirit for a reason. Yeah, right. <laughs> And it's not through your words. It's through your abiding in Him. It's through your connection to His being. It's from when you're in His presence. And He begins to change you and work on you. And the love and the nature and the character of God comes into you. The scripture says in, in, in Peter that we are partakers of the divine nature. I love it. When you look that word up in the original language, it says that we're sharers of the divine nature. I get to share. It's that same word like a fellowship, and it's also expressed through intimacy. That we are sharers together. We there, There's this, this exchange going on between the Father and us. And that is His Holy Spirit in us. And the Holy Spirit in us makes us victorious. So when I'm struggling, I'm like, Father, my heart is tangled. I feel this thing trying to bring me down. My, out, my cry out to God is, I can't beat this. I need you to help me. I need you to deliver me. I need you to be my deliverer. And I'm just going to press it to you. Amen. Amen. And when I do that, a knot so tightly tangled I can never untangle, he untangles my feet out of the net. Hallelujah. I'm like, not even looking at the knot. But I'm looking at him. Right? <laughs> Good word. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's cool, because we've been married for quite a while, and, you know, she repeats things I've said, and I repeat things she said, because we're sharers together, and we get to be sharers of the divine nature. Okay, so let's keep going, because I know I, I haven't really given, I, I, I've given you, like, what I'm saying, but I want to give you the proof, right, the evidence, I want to present the case. So it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Yeshua the Messiah were baptized into his death? You died with him, right? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That just like the Messiah was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in the newness of life. We were meant to walk in the newness of life with him, to be raised with him. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Look at this, because it's the old man coming up. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth you should not serve sin. Amen. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel is that Yeshua in you isn't subject to sin. Right? Now, I'm not teaching sinless perfection. I, or just to, you know, always, you always got to clarify what you are and aren't saved. I'm saying this, that every one of us as a believer has the, it is, every single one of us in this room and in the world at large as a believer, we're either um, yielding to one of two things. We're either yielding to our flesh, and we may be doing it as a religious person, okay? We may, we may be doing it as someone who is actually honestly wanting to serve God, but you're dealing with something very powerful in you. And the scripture says that, that you're, if you're in your flesh, you can't please God. So you're either in your flesh or in the spirit. When you're in your flesh, you're trying to overcome sin and you fail. That is the story of it, when you're in your flesh. But when you're in the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. You guys see what I'm saying? So we're in a place of yielding. We're in a place of yielding to the Spirit or yielding to the flesh. For he that 
In, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Okay, so sometimes if we're not getting free from sin, maybe it's because we haven't died. Because he that's dead is free from, free from sin. And so here's where I want to talk about something is that, you know, really it's our alignment of our heart with God that fills us with the Spirit. Okay, because we can talk about you know, how can I be filled, filled with the Spirit. But it's the alignment of God. You know, all the time, you know, people, I, I believe a lot of times, you know, man is talking about the seeing healing and things going on, but actually they were leading them in repentance. They were leading them, leading them in to get rid of bitterness. Because the reality is, is that God always wants to heal. God always wants to do the miraculous. But when we aren't in alignment with Him, right. it doesn't happen. Right. Okay? And so it's when we come into alignment with Him that this power flows, that the Holy Spirit flows. And one of those things that is that alignment is, is death. Now, I'm not talking about the physical body. We're talking about, you know, Paul said, I die daily, right? Um, you know, Yeshua said to take up your cross daily and follow him. And that if you uh, seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, you're going to have life. That's the key to life, is giving up your life. When you give up your life, you get life. When you try to protect your life, you lose it. Because that's the way the kingdom works. Right. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion or over him. For in that he died, he died to sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. Look at this, is really good advice, everybody. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Consider your, you know, you always live what you believe. If your framework is, is I can, I can't, we can't overcome sin, that's what you're going to live out. That's what you're going to walk out as a man thinks in his heart he is. Right? He says, but consider, see, if you consider yourself in sin, you're going to live in sin. But if you reject that and agree with the word of God, Amen. then you'll consider yourself to be dead. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Amen. Let not sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in, your, in its lust. Neither yield yourselves as members of, or instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead. Woo! As members of instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Sin shall not rule over you. That's what my, that's what your Bible, my Bible, that's what the Word of God says, is that sin shall not rule over you. I want to tell you something. The blood of Yeshua has the power to wash your sins, to free you from sin, to, to free you from the bondage of sin, to free you from walking in sin. He's not a weak God. Mm -mm. Okay? Amen. He, he said that repent through repentance is remission of sins. Repentance implies the ability to do. When he says, when he commands something to do, it's because you can do it by the spirit that's in you. Right. And repentance means stop sinning. Amen. Repentance means stop serving self. It doesn't mean being sorry. Okay? Every every drunk that lives on the street or drug addict that is is there because I know people are there for different reasons. I'm not wrong brushing. But that sister who has lost her family because of alcohol, lost her job because of drugs, lost her health because of what they're doing. You know what? They're sorry. You ask them. They hate their sin. Not only that, but they'll tell you what the gospel is. Because they know it. Right? Oftentimes, repentance is not Just being because sorry. I heard it taught. That, well, before you were a sinner and you didn't care, and now you're a sinner, but you feel bad about it, and that shows that you repented. Anybody ever heard that before? <laughs> I've heard that. It's not. It, it's that you turn. To turn. You turn. And you can do it because the Spirit yeah. is life. The Spirit is life. 
Let's do one more spot here in Romans 8. And then, and then I'm going to go to Galatians 5 real quick, too. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Who's in Christ Jesus? Who walk not after the flesh. If, if you walk in your flesh, you're not in Christ Jesus. You see what I'm saying? That's what the Word says. But after the Spirit. <laughs> you know, and then they get really tricky doctors like, well, you, you, you can, if you're a believer, you're in Christ, you're not in your flesh, even though you're still listening to your flesh. It's a bunch of garbage. Right? Amen. For the law of the Spirit of life in Yeshua the Messiah has made me free. Woo! From the law of sin and death. I don't have to live in bondage. And I wish somebody really taught me that a long time ago. And I really wish somebody had showed me how to do that. Because I think that's where a lot of us are at. It's like, man, I know this is true. But how do we do that? How do we walk that out? Obtain it. Right? For what the law could not do. See, the law of God is good. Don't get me wrong. The law of God is a revelation of the righteousness of God. You know, Paul said that the law is good if a man uses it properly. But the law was never made, made to save you. Okay, that covenant, the law of God shows you where you're wrong, yes. but it doesn't make you right. Amen. Okay? <laughs> it's a good thing. Amen. But when you use it wrongfully, that is, if you use it as a means of righteousness, Amen. you're going to get made up by it. Right? Because why? Because it's bad? No, because you are. <laughs> Outside of Christ. Right. Right? Because it's going to show you that you transgressed it. And then what will you do? Right? Because why would it even come? Why would he hung on a cross and shed his precious blood if there was any other way to be righteous? Right? Because he's going to make you righteous and it's not going to be because you did so many good works that now you're righteous. But you do have to yield your life to him. You do have to yield your heart to him. And then he comes inside you and he does what you can never do. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. See, he, that righteousness that before we couldn't fulfill... It's established. Did we do away with it? No, it's established in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. For they that and this is where we're this is where we gotta get this, guys. This is really practical rubber meets the road part right here. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. You know, you can you can self-evaluate your, yourself, right? We're in a war. Every believer, you know, I want to say something here. If you didn't get, uh, come to God, you know, get on your knees and weep before Him or whatever it was that you did and repent of your sins and have a one-time experience. And now, there you go. Go on. You're forever in the Spirit from here on forward. You never have to do anything. That's not how it works. Right? It's not. Now you're, now you're in the Spirit. You're good. Okay? Because Paul talks about... And, and I think it's from Romans 6 there, if we yield ourselves again to those things that we were delivered from, we become again a transgressor. I become again under the flesh. If I'm in my flesh, I'm under condemnation. Your doctrine might tell you that you're not under condemnation while you're living in sin, but your conscience will let, never let you get away with it. That's right. right. Because your doctrine might tell you that you're once saved, always saved, but you know that you've been doing things you should you shouldn't be doing. And in their and in their doctrine, in their mind, they're saying, But I know, I know I'm a child of God, but you can't escape that you feel the separation. You right. can't escape the, 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 the guilt and the shame that is only released through repentance. Right. It's not God's will that you live in shame. He wants to take your failures and remove them from you as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't want to rub your face where you fail. No. That's not his heart. Right? But he, thank God he gave you conscience that even if your false doctrine tells you you're over your right with God, I know a lot of people that are there. 
conscious and that won't leave them alone. They know. They're not experiencing fellowship. They're not experiencing it or walking in the flesh. And so because it was not a one-time thing that, you know, otherwise, why do we take cross daily, right? Why do we do? And so what did we do? Yeshua was our perfect example. Because we're, we're in a body of flesh that the Spirit rules over. Okay? If the Spirit of God is in you, then your flesh, flesh is subject to it. Your flesh is subject to the Spirit. Yes. But if the Spirit of God is not permeating your walk every day, your flesh rules over you. You guys see what I'm saying? And you're not going to overcome it by a, 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 a you know, New Year's resolution. You're not going to overcome it by, I'm going to be strong this time. You might be strong for a while, but you're going to fail. But if you learn to let the Holy Spirit live in you daily, and I'm talking about daily walking in His presence, learning to pray, learning to do the one thing. See, that one thing that He told us to do is, is success in every part of our life. Right. It's success in everything we do. And so if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be a fruitful worker out in this field, it's because I'm walking in the spirit. If I'm gonna overcome even my own flesh, it's because I'm walking in my spirit. And I'm never taking confidence in my flesh. I need to learn to, to walk every single day yielded on him. Yielded to him, looking at him, knowing that is in my flesh most no good thing. Right? But when he's in me, he's the good that's in me. Mm -hmm. And so Yeshua went into the wilderness and he fasted and he prayed. He communed with God. In Luke 4, 14, it says that he returned in the power of the Spirit. Right? right. Four verses later, he gets up and he says, The Spirit of Yahuwah, Elohim, the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set at liberty those that are captives, to give sight to the blind through the Spirit. The Spirit is upon me to do these things. Right? Amen. I want to learn to be so yielded to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, here's something that's really interesting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here. The message. Um, the idea of prayer is something that we really lost connection to what it means because we know that word in English. Right. Okay? And this is a really beautiful thing. Is when I looked up the Aramaic word for prayer, which we know that they spoke Aramaic, that was the lingua franca of the of the world that where Yeshua lived, that was what he taught in, that's what the everyday language was. And so when they were using this and this is a sister language to Hebrew, and, and, and it's a shared root with Hebrew. It's this word cell. So the word cell or celi is a word for prayer. And I thought, well, that, and I, you know, learned some Hebrew. So I was like, well, that's a Hebrew word, but that, that doesn't mean prayer. That means something else. And so it took me on a little bit of a journey as I wanted to know what prayer meant. And so the Hebrew word for, uh, the Hebrew word cell is a word for shade. And shadow, shade or shadow, um, and it also is a word for a rib, and it, like like the rib that God took from man's side, that's itself, and then He made a woman from it. And it, and as a verb, it has to do with leaning into the side of, or leaning into close with. And I think it's really interesting that he, that it's a word for rib because it was a rib He made a woman. And then they twain become one flesh. And without going into that whole thing, the, the idea itself is to be united with God. And so when, when it says that he spent all night in prayer, you know, we think prayer is an old English word that means to beg. And so he spent all night begging. You know, the, it doesn't even actually, the word cell doesn't even imply a request. The word request or petition is a different word. It's used. You can, you can request while you unite with God, right? Right. But that word for prayer is meant to go ask for things. It doesn't mean to ask for things. Do you guys know that? 
So if I'm going to pray, it doesn't mean I'm going to go ask for things. It literally means I'm going to unite with Him. I'm going to become one with Him. Like the rib, right? They too shall be one flesh. Hallelujah. And then it says in Ephesians 5, we're bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. Amen. And so Yeshua would spend all night uniting with the Father, right? That's what he was doing. And so when we think of what prayer is, we, we put all this religious um, garb on it, right? And it has to be done in this position, on my knees, or like, and those are good positions to pray in, right? That's great, but we can make it a thing. Right. You guys know what I'm saying? Right. Instead of, you know, prayer can be you laying back on your couch, your arms behind your head, and just enjoying the presence of God and uniting with Him. Because when you unite with Him, there is the power to do everything that He's called you to do. That's why I love worship. Well, I got one more scripture. I said I was going to read. Galatians, thank you. <laughs> Dan knows. Dan's keeping you on track. This is really beautiful. It's beautiful that I'm glad that the pressure is off. That I don't have to do these things. That I don't have to be good enough. I don't have to be strong enough. I don't have to have I don't have to be have a lot of willpower. I don't have to be those things in me. I can just yield to Him and rest in Him. And these things come forth as fruit. Amen. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. So this is a command, right? I know I'm going slowly through this, but this is a teaching, this is practical teaching. I want us to get this. What chapter? Five. Five. Walk in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. That's a command. Okay, you don't want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. It doesn't say that resist it really hard. Right? I mean, you do have to resist. But there's a means by which you do it. By the Spirit of God. And so you do it by walking in the Spirit. What is walking in the Spirit? It's, it's uniting. It's yielding to His Spirit. Okay? You're either yielding to your flesh. That's giving in, opening up to your flesh. And becoming united with the flesh. Or you are yielding to the Spirit, becoming united with Him, and, and letting Him live in you. And let Him be on your mind every day. We, we've lost the idea of prayer within the church. Right? We've lost the idea of what it really means to have heartfelt prayer. I would even say this, you know, like back um, in America's history, there was a time where they had the Dust Bowl. You guys remember the, her, hearing about the Dust Bowl? It was because there was a lack of moisture. And that everything dried because there was a lack of moisture and things couldn't grow. There was no fruit. It was barrenness because without moisture is barrenness. And, you know, I want to say this is that, you know, people used to know in the church. And I, and I remember being in a church like that, weeping over your sins and repentance, letting the tears flow. Mm -hmm. Yeshua wept. We can, you can chalk it up to emotionalism. But Yeshua wept. Right? We have, a, we have a spiritual dust bowl going on. There's barrenness and lack of fruitfulness because there's no moisture. Because our eyes don't go down with tears in prayer. I'll tell you, every time when you read the, about the children of Israel, and they be brought into bondage, and their enemies were oppressing them, and they would say that they would cry unto God, and that his heart would be moved with compassion, and he would deliver them from all their enemies. See, this Hallelujah. It, doesn't, it doesn't appeal to our flesh, because I'm not telling you you're going to do it because you are strong. I'm telling you, you're going to have to get into a place of dependence. Where you're going to humble everything that's you. Amen. Amen. And say, God, I can't do it. My flesh is too strong. Yeah. My temptations are too great. And we learn to cry out to God. Amen. We learn to really pour our heart out to Him. I started with Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. 
not by might nor by power. I, want, I, I like this is a really good position for preaching. <laughs> Sometimes when we when we think about everything he's called us to do, the job's too great, and the task is too large. There's more than we could ever muster. The, the needs are too much. The financial needs too big. Whatever, right? We can't. You know, when you look at it, it's a mountain. But he said, "Hey guys, don't go." Until you receive power. And so on your own, we'll never do it. And there's going to have to be a real humbling of our flesh. And our pride doesn't like it. And religion will do every aspect of religion. Except for spending time with God in prayer. It's hard, isn't it, guys? It see, it feels hard. Why don't we do it? You know, if we were, if we we're not going to do it. But if we were to ask, you know, what's the time? How much time do you spend every day in prayer? And we start, and then we ask, how many of you are experiencing victory over sin in your flesh, in your life? And then if we could connect those two things. We'll stop building a doctrine that says you can't overcome, but we'll realize that we haven't done the one thing, which is very dependent, right? I need you, God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Give more people. 
people show up, have more prayer meetings. And I know it to be true. You know, before I went to Tanzania last time, Lord gave me a vision of me and James standing in that stadium praying for revival over that region. And you know, when we got to stand in that stadium, I walked right in the middle of a soccer game and stood right in the middle of the field, and the guys didn't mind. They, in fact, they, 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 they welcomed me out there. We just stood in time. Jim was walking around barefooted around the field, and I'm standing in the middle of the frame. Sandy's over there praying, Rusty's over there praying, and nobody minded at all. Nobody minded, because the Spirit of the Lord is so heavy upon it. But he said there will be a revival there, and there will be a crusade, and we're supposed to, to, to be involved in it. Hallelujah. If it's a good moment to hear up. Yeah, yeah, good time. Um, I, I just really feel like I'm sitting here, and I just feel like Holy Spirit, you can confer if it's Him or not, but just to invite people to come repent for trusting in themselves instead of Him. Hallelujah. Can we do that? <laughs> you just love. for walking in the flesh. Forgive us for trying to do it in our own strength. tried to conquer the flesh in our own strength. Yes, Abba. We ask you to come in. Teach us to walk in your spirit. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Father, 
trusted in everything but you. flesh, but when we rely on your spirit, we can have victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you all. You do have the ability to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Don't underestimate the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. He is more powerful. your flesh, and your flesh can yield to the Spirit. Thank you, Abba. Yeshua's name, amen. 